CLC, how you guys doing? Awesome, awesome, awesome. I might need a little stand here if I could get that. Hey, I just want to welcome you if you're visiting or that you call this church home. You have fallen in with an incredible group of people. This is amazing. What you feel here. I, let, let, me, let me say thank you, bro. I gave my life to Jesus Christ on a college campus, and uh, I grew up uh, I grew up inner city Oakland, and, and, and we were uh, economically challenged. You don't understand that translation. We po, not poor, po. We couldn't afford the other O and R on Wheel of Fortune. We didn't have two hundred fifty dollars to buy a vowel from Vanna. Okay, we were we was poor. But uh, my mom and dad, uh, they they did not plan. My mom nor dad, they did not plan to have a child. They were not married. I was born out of wedlock. And uh, I just want to fast forward. At nine years of age, I, I met my dad for the first time when I was five. At nine years of age, he was in and out of my life from five to nine. He lived in another city, San Jose, California. I grew up in Oakland, California, if you understand, cities on the West Coast. And, and my dad was murdered. It was, it, it was proven in court. It was racially motiv- motivated by policemen. And I obviously support law enforcement. I've got relatives. I've got great friends that are, that are on the police department. They lay down their lives, but these particular officers were not honoring that badge. It's proven their court was racially motivated. So I went through my high school years, listen to me, ex- in a massive experimentation. When you experience that level of pain, you're asking some sort of experience to rescue you from the heartache and the, 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 this kind of disenfranchisement, I guess, I'm, I'm, I don't know, it's making up a word there, but you feel so disenfranchised, you feel so disconnected from everything around you. And so I chose this school. Now, here's why I fast forward. I get to college. In the meantime, my grandmother, I, I share this with the gals. Ladies, where are you at? How many of you come on out? Did, did we have an awesome women's conference or what? I, I came in, I got to be a guy, I got to be there. I didn't have to look like Medea. I just came through looking like me, and y'all let me in and, and supported me. <laughs> Obviously a reference to Tyler Perry's character there. But uh, my grandmother, uh, she pretty much raised me. My mom was working jobs, so I was raised by two awesome, awesome women. But neither of them were saved. And then my grandmother, she goes to this small Pentecostal holding storefront church. She gives her life to Christ. She's immediately delivered. She comes back home, breaks all her alcohol bottles. I mean, after multiple decades of being dependent upon this substance, she doesn't need it anymore. She breaks it all, cold turkey. She gets Jesus in her life. And, man, she starts telling me about Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, 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 Grandma, you know, you're young. You just think, oh, no, you know. So I'm in college. I'm partying. I'm immoral. I'm in all this stuff. And I didn't realize how much the bottom was falling out in, in, in my heart. Like, I'm partying, I'm thinking it's good, and, and I tell people, I would not have fit the profile of anyone that would have taken their life, but I was, I was going to do it. It wasn't just I had a suicidal thought. I had a suicidal plan. I was going to carry this thing out. I, I'm not telling you this to make my testimony sexy. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I was going to end my life. And so, but my grandmother had given her life to the Lord, and I had promised my grandmother, and, and she gave her life to the Lord, and then she went to be with the Lord, I had promised my grandmother, uh, she said, baby, you promised me. One day you're going to find out you cannot live this thing uh, called life all on your own. Promise me you will call on the name of Jesus. That was the exact words. So I promised her that. And I'm like, if you promise your southern black grandma from Dumas, Arkansas, that you're going to call on Jesus, you better do it or she will throw a calcified biscuit from heaven and it will rotate like Thor's hammer, Euromill, whatever that's called, hit you upside your head and come back, right? So I knew I needed to do that. So this was my plan. I'm going to party like no tomorrow. I mean, I'll party. I'm going to come back. I'm going to call on my grandma's Jesus, and the next day I'm going to end my life. That's how I thought. Because obviously, if you're listening to the plan, I didn't think Jesus was going to answer my prayer like that. So I came back from partying. I mean, it, it's like I cried out to God. It's after midnight, maybe 1, 1 a.m. in the morning. I cried out to midnight. I passed out. And then I'm awakened. Now, I didn't even share this first service. You may be visiting, and you may think, wow, that's a stretch, Sean. But let me just tell you, my degree is in computer engineering. I was offered a job by Intel in Silicon Valley upon graduation. I, for a kid that grew up economically challenged, a.k.a. Poe, right, that was a fulfillment of my dreams. For me to tell them no and to do what I'm doing now is because of what I'm going to share with you. I cry out to Jesus. I pass out. I'm awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mind you, I'm not taking any hallucinogenic drugs, so there's no reason for, for what I'm going to tell you happened to me outside of Jesus. I'm awakened at 3 a.m. in the morning in my studio apartment, which is a glorified way of saying it was one-bedroom shack, right? I'm awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning. I see Jesus like I see you. 
I see people say, what does Jesus look like? Yeah, John who wrote Revelation did a good job. His eyes are like lightning. His face is like the sun shining. Man, he looked like human torch. I mean, I could see corporeality. I could see arms. He had uh, legs. He spoke to him. I heard the audible voice of God. He says, right, I see this like human fire, but it's not human fire. It's human, like, look like body, but it's Jesus. And he obviously lets me know. He says, uh, you, you've asked that I've answered that prayer. I've come to answer that prayer. And now I call upon you to do what you said you do. And I said, God, I'll give you everything. But by the way, the first thing he said to me is, I'll be a father to the fatherless. I didn't even know that was in the Bible until like two years later, okay? So how many of you know when he said, I'll be a father to fathers, have you heard my story about growing up without a dad? Anybody old enough to remember the old Jerry Maguire movie, the classic line, you had me at hello, hello. Jesus had me at hello, right? And at that point in time, man, I, I just started bawling. I just feel the love of God. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He spoke to me about what I'm doing today. But I said all that to say this. Jesus was so real to me. I'm on a secular college campus. I get up the next day. I start witnessing and telling everybody I can about Jesus. I had led 25 people to Christ in the first month I was saved. It wasn't even, amen, amen, amen. It wasn't even that I was that great at witnessing. It was that they were that shocked that I was saved. like, oh, God, you saved. There must be a God. I pledged this wild fraternity, man. I, I led all my fraternity brothers but one to the Lord, and they were more party hoorah brothers than I was. Three weeks into this thing, I'm standing up on my college campus on a picnic bench in the student university center. I'm preaching Jesus. On a, nobody told me that I needed to change my life. I immediately, like, I broke up with my girlfriend, like, hey, what we're doing, we can't do that anymore. I told my friend, brother, hey, man, I'm not going to be partying like that no more, man. I got, and the crazy part about it is I pulled out the Bible in my first week I was saved. I read through the New Testament three times. I, I didn't even have someone say, you need to read the Bible. It's like when you meet Jesus. I mean, really, you, 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 oh, come on, somebody. I mean, when you really meet Jesus, it's not a fact that you got to start doing right. He puts a desire in you to live right. Like, like people say, well, if I give my life to the Lord, I can't do what I desire. No, 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 no. Jesus will change your desires. So what you desire isn't killing you, hurting you, diminishing the quality of your life, and saddening the people that love you. It's like he gave me a desire, like deep down inside. And, and I, I'm here right now because Jesus is that real. I just want to let you guys know that. Hey, I, I just want to say the McQuays are awesome. You guys got phenomenal leadership. Pastors Jerry and Chris and Brent and your team, amazing. I met Pastor Carlton. Your worship, oh, my God, your worship up here. Come on, ladies. I mean, y'all are, there, there, there is blessed and then they're spoiled. Y'all are spoiled. Everybody hits the mic up here can sing like Tasha Cobb or sing like, you know, like Commission or, you know, something. I mean, it's amazing. My wife. No, I, I went old school. I don't know if y'all know nothing about no commission here. No, I guess I need some saints with some gray in their hair. Know something about, come on, Fred Hammond and Marvin Sapp and Mitchell Jones. Come on and them. Oh, okay, okay. I got saved listening to their music. See, I'm just going to throw this in. They sang the word. There's some folks today singing their feelings. I need you to sing the word sometime, right? I, I, I mean, I got disciple because they were singing New Testament, all right? My beautiful wife, Krista's here. She brought a phenomenal word. It was amazing. Krista, stand up and wave at everybody. This is my wife, Krista. We're going to dive in this. How many of you were here first service? Lift your hand up. How many of you were first service? Okay, not a lot of you. All right, so the majority of you are new. I, I'm going to do this. I sometimes do this. I feel like I'm supposed to preach a different word. So, I, I would encourage you, I don't know if first service word was recorded. Oh, it is. So you can go online, catch that. But I want to share with you a different word. So I want you to go to Luke chapter 5. As you go to Luke chapter 5, uh, I, uh, oh man, I'm going to give away some stuff. My wife has written a book. I can't give this away because we don't have that many left. I'm sorry. Or should I? Should I give it away? No, it's great. My wife says give it away. My wife has written her first book called Sing It Out. Singles, singled out. I got to slow down. My lips are so excited right now singled out in a couple's world. It's her first book. It's part of her story. And she just talked about 
that some people treat singleness like it's some sort of disease you got to be set free or delivered from. But she talks about God is purposeful in your season of singleness, that you can steward those single years. And, and you know what? If, G, if, if you think you need a marital partner to be enough, then, or, or let me rephrase it, if Jesus isn't enough, whoever you married wouldn't be enough. You, Jesus has got to be enough, and then now you got the cherry on top of the Sunday. But it isn't just for single people, and I, I would encourage you to get it for someone that you know is single. But she used singleness as a metaphor of an Isaac that we all have to lay on an altar. And God may give it back to you, and then may, he may require it of you. But the bottom line is this, is that we all have to wait before the Lord on certain things in our life. And it proves lordship that we're willing to put him first even though we didn't get those things. Only little kids throw themselves on the ground and throw a tantrum because they didn't get what they want. But the Bible, now y'all understand me with this, the Bible tells us to be childlike, not childish. And so maturity is, God, I trust you. I trust your timing. And so who would like this? I want to give this to somebody. Any of you ladies in the worship team, I want to give it to, y'all sisters are amazing. Y'all, okay, here we go. Oh, she went here and cashed it, okay. I've written a book on prophetic evangelism. I will give this away. It is basically how to hear the voice of God and how to share that with someone that doesn't know the Lord. So you become the voice of God in a way that leads them to the Lord. People say, well, does God speak to you to other people? Yeah, he does. And I'll, 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 I'll submit to you, we all believe that that stuff happens. Let me, let me give you an example. How many of you believe the devil can speak to you? Come on, lift your hand up. Okay, if you, if you didn't know it, it's called temptation. Whenever you're tempted, devil's speaking to you. How many of you believe that God, the devil, can speak to someone and they can become the mouthpiece of the enemy to discourage you, to slander you, to accuse you, to go petty on you? Okay, so we're acknowledging the devil can speak to someone and the devil can speak to someone to discourage you. So let me say something to you. Don't make the devil more powerful than your God. You ought to be able to believe then that God can speak to you and he can speak to you to encourage someone just like the devil can speak to someone to use them to discourage you. And so I talked to you about how to do it, how to become the voice of God. I, I walked, I'm going to tell you this story and I'm actually preaching. I walked into a psychic parlor in Monterey, California, total new age capital, if you will, in, in California. And I walked over and I felt like the Lord told me to witness to this psychic lady and as I'm waiting to, to witness to her, the Lord said, I want you to tell her three things. Tell her, number one, I am your sign. Okay, how many of you know that had to be God? I don't walk up to ladies I'm not married to and go, I am your sign, okay? I don't even say that to my wife, and I'm married to her. I don't believe in astrology, right? I am your sign. Number two, tell her uh, when she was young, she got hurt by the church. She ended up moving in with an Eastern guru that she thought was going to nurture her, but he ended up abusing her. She got thrusted out. And number three, ever since she was a little girl, she didn't want, she's reading tarot cards. That wasn't her dream. She's doing it by default. And let her know if she'll let go of the default, I'll give her her dream back. Now, again, I'm in a psychic parlor. It's not a church. Come on, somebody. This isn't a Christian Bible study, a home group. I walked over to her, and I said, hey, by the way, after a little preliminary talk, I said, the Lord sent me to tell you I am your sign. She turns her head from me, and I can see tears. Well, the story behind it is the night before, she cried out to the cosmos. She worshiped the cosmos, and she said, show me a sign. Can you imagine God is like, here's the devil in the second heavens. God's in the third heaven. Paul talks about that. I can see God saying, boom, excuse me, devil. You're not going to answer that one. I'm going to get my servant. So it spoke to her because that's her exact words. That was her prayer, I am your sign. I'm thinking, God, why would you have me walk up to someone and go, I am your sign? But it just goes to show you when God speaks to you, you it doesn't make sense, but you got to not go with your head. Sometimes you got to go with your heart. I spoke to her about the abuse, how she ended up with the Eastern Guru. She said this the exact thing. She was in this religious school that was very legalistic. She ended up moving in with the Eastern Guru. He ended up abusing her sexually, physically, emotionally. She got thrusted out. All she thought she could do was read tarot cards. And she says, ever since I was a little girl, remember, if you let go of the default to give you design. She says, ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted to paint. Never thought I could pay the bills painting. So I stuck with tarot card. So she said, oh, my God. How did you know that? Now, check it out. She's got 40 people in line to get their fortune read, and she's shocked that I knew that. 
That ought to tell you something. You shouldn't be paying them whatever you're paying them. They don't know. That's why it says at the end of them things, for entertainment purposes only, because it's showing them psychics are trying to entertain you, but not only entertain you, they're trying to introduce bondage. She prays the prayer to give her life to Jesus Christ at a New Age bookstore in Monterey, California. She stands up and tells all the people in line, I'm not doing this anymore, goes to the counter, gets her last check, quits, and says, do you know a good church where I can continually serve Jesus? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. That's prophetic evangelism right there. There's no way I walk into a psychic bookstore and walk out with a Jesus-loving sister apart from that. I want to give this to somebody who would like this. Okay, sis, in the second row, you're so, you jumped up so quick. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Are y'all having fun so far? All right, here we go. Luke chapter 5. We're going to start reading. Luke 5 says, Now it happened on a certain day as he, as Jesus, was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, somebody say, "Uh uh-oh, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they uh, sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find out how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went to the housetop, or some translation says the roof, the roof, the roof is no, and let them down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to a man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived, excuse me, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, Jesus knows what you're thinking, gang. He answered and said to him, why are you reasoning in your hearts, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk, but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, go to your house. And now one more verse. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on. That's the gospel right there. God lets you take up what you had been stuck to lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and they were filled with uh, fear, saying we've seen strange things today. Now Mark 2 verse 1 is a parallel passage, synoptic gospel. It says in Mark 2 verse 1, it says, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately, People, uh, excuse me, immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive him, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Preached the word to them. This is a phenomenal passage, and I can't wait to break this open, but I want to begin here. How many of you know that sometimes we use words that are words that are the same, but they're really not the same. We think they're synonyms, but they're not synonyms. Let me give you an example of that. Actually, there's several examples. One is sometimes words that we use like normal and typical. How many of you know we think they're synonyms, but they're really not, right? If you're coughing, you go to the doctor, nose is running, right? And the doctor checks you out. Here she does all this stuff, breathing. Let's say it's not COVID-related, right? And they do everything, and they go, what you have is typical. Now, what they mean is, What you have is typical to other sick people. What you have isn't normal of a healthy person. They're trying to not, you know, they're trying to keep you from being too alarming so you won't get too afraid. So they say what you have is typical. And and really, it isn't, uh, let me rephrase it. They say what you have is normal. What they mean is what you have is typical. It's not normal compared to a healthy person. It's typical of a sick person. Did I say that right? Did you get me? I think sometimes we misinterpret a typical Christian versus a normal Christian, right? Like what we do is we compare ourselves by ourselves. We look at other average Christians in North America, and this is what other Christians are doing, so it's okay. So we think we're normal, but we're not normal. We're just typical of what other people are doing because when God shows us what Christianity ought to look like, God's normal looks different than our normal. What we're calling normal is really abnormal, subnormal. God's got to send revival for us to see what normal ought to look like. That it's in times of moves of God where God gives us if you will, a standard, and it's in times leading up to moves of God that God begins to raise a standard. I feel like right now God is raising a standard. I feel like there are people that have come back to church 
that have come out of the whole COVID quarantine and stuff, and they're coming back more hungry for God. I feel a desperation. Every place my wife and I go, you could feel the desperation for the more of God. There are people that are saying, I don't want just a little bit of Jesus and add it into my life and just kind of feel like I'm going to compartmentalize and I got Jesus over here on Sunday, but then I got to go do my stuff on Monday. I'm in my hustle by Wednesday. I'm partying by Friday, Saturday night. No, that's not Christianity, not North American. No, let me rephrase it. Not New Testament Christianity. It may be North American, but God's trying to get us to go New Testament. We used to have a phrase, don't bring that Kool-Aid to a gin party, okay? Now, there's not a sanctity thought, but you know what I'm saying? It's like we, we right now, we can't bring a compromised, broke Christianity to the modern dance of North America. Like pretenders are being weeded away. They didn't make it back, right? Now I understand people may be watching and, and, and there could be health risks or people that are at distance or something you got to watch online, but there's some folks, how many of you know, they just avoided church and this last season just proved how connected were you really before church? I, I can say that. I'm a visitor, so I'm going to say that. Isn't that funny? People say, well, I don't know. It's still kind of from health conditions and all that. Hey, that's not stopping you from going to Walmart, Kmart, Target, Home Depot. You made it back there. How come you can't make it back to church? I like my, I like my chances in this aisle than aisle 12 at Home Depot. At least in this aisle, I got some people left and right of me to believe in Jesus because lay some slap hand, lay some oil on me and get me healed. Come on, somebody. Are y'all here this morning? I believe that God is bringing back people that are hungry for God. And I've never seen the level of hunger for God amongst God's people. And then you intersect that with the level of desperation of the world out there. And whenever there's been this intersection of desperation and spiritual hunger in past seasons, there's been revival and awakening. Could this be right now that we'll look back at this point and what we thought was like something we were trying to get out of is exactly God's fast track to get us into what God's got for us. Hold that thought. There are three types of honeymoons. I'm going to need you to be mature with me right now. Three types of honeymoon as I see it. Honeymoon number one. Honeymoon number one, you and your spouse, your newlywed, Your boo, you finally have, man, got away someplace. You've been saving up. You did the money tree. You had the money tree dance, you know, stuff like the the sanctified money tree dance, right? And all of a sudden, people gave you money. You went to a place. You're taking all the pictures. You're eating all the foods. You're visiting all the sites. You're gathering all the souvenirs and trinkets. And so you want to come back to home and show your people, this is where we ate, this is where we went, this is what we saw, this is what we brought back. Because why? Because it's probably going to be 10 years again before you can get that much money to have a nice vacation. So you want to live it up. That's, that's honeymoon number one. Say number two. Honeymoon number two. You and your boo, you and your spouse, your newlywed, y'all have held out. You've been pure. Come on, somebody know where I'm going. You are not outside doing all the different sightseeing and eat all. You are holed up in a bungalow. You're doing takeout food. You have dropped off the radar because you got five days to fulfill the Genesis mandate to repopulate the earth, and you ain't playing. Come on, because y'all been pure. All right, I told y'all I need you to be mature. Honeymoon number two. Honeymoon number three is the kind my wife and I had. It's funny because we were recently on the East Coast of New Jersey. guy picked us up in an Uber, and he picked us up in an Uber. He had a Dominican Republic flag, and that's where we spent our honeymoon. We went to Punta Cana in Dominican Republic. And, and kind of hold that thought, I'm actually doing matrix preaching. You know, I'm kind of turning around on you. Where I grew up, and now I eschew, meaning I do not appreciate stereotypes and generalizations. So please understand, what I'm sharing with you, I'm not trying to play into a stereotype or generalization. I'm just trying to be real with you. Where I grew up in my neighborhood, right, my neighborhood, the people that I grew up around, right? We did not like water. Okay, I'm just going to tell you right now. Partially because in the hood I grew up, you needed your uncle to teach you how to swim. The only problem is your uncle didn't know how to swim because his uncle didn't show him. So the local pool was closed down because there wasn't nobody swimming. I mean, we grew up, and this is unique because we grew up on the West Coast, so there's a little bit of beach and water, and the water came to our ankles, came to our knees. It's cool, but we would hear a story about people getting bit by sharks and all that kind of stuff. They put movies out on that stuff. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd take a bath and shower, but I wasn't trying to swim. I didn't really like water, right? And, and okay, and I know it sounds like I'm playing to a generalization, but 
some, I noticed some black people don't like water, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying, when you see a black person get water baptized, y'all need to clap louder because it took a greater level of courage for them to conquer that. Just say it, all right? Just say it, all right? Just say it, all right? The other thing in our neighborhood we didn't like, we didn't like heights. I would get about as high as Ms. Jones' plum tree, so I'd climb up just enough to get some plums because I love plums, but I didn't like no heights, okay? I know that's not great English. So why, am I, why are you telling me that, Sean? Because when I got married, I determined I was not going to have any of them lids in my life anymore. So honeymoon number three, say number three, is where you attempt every death-defying, adrenaline, juice-flowing, heart-pumping, man, exploit you can. We did it all. We zip-lined in Punta Cana a mile high over an open man like cavern, right? Or whatever you would call it, canyon. We are mile high. We're going 60 miles an hour. There is no net, bro, no net. Like, they wouldn't even do that in United. He said, I wouldn't do it. He's like, this. no, I wouldn't even do it, right? And I'm like, oh, oh, my heart's coming. I'm like, go, ah! And then all of a sudden, as I'm going, I start spinning around. You don't want to be going down your zip line backwards. I put my hand up on there, and they just gave you like little garden working gloves, right? It burned through the glove. I honestly thought I'd rip my finger off. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to pull a glove off, and it's going to be like a severed limb, and it's going to be like, you know, maybe pointing at people. I'm going, yeah, you need to go that way, <laughs> you know. I'm like, what am I doing? How many of you know that conquered heights? But I still have some water. We swam with sharks. I don't mean that sharks was in a cage and I was outside a cage, or we were in a cage and a shark. I'm talking about we're in the same pool of water the shark is. They told us they sawed off the shark's teeth, but we just had to take their word for it. <laughs> we petted stingrays. Am I, isn't that true? The stingray spat at me, right? I'm petting the stingray. It had a little nub on the back, but I didn't take their word. They said, we, well, it shouldn't sting you, right? And I'm like, okay, we did this. We got in water. We did boat rides. We did a speedboat thing, and, and the tour guide, he's in a speedboat, and all the rest of his two or three per speedboat, so we had our own speedboat. He takes off. I'm a bit competitive. His California driving comes out at me. I'm like, I'm keeping up with him. I pass all the other folks, and all of a sudden, I probably got too fast, and it was choppy, so we started bouncing like this thing. At one point, we both went up. We thought this is going to flip. <laughs> oh, my God, and we out in the water. i like, do we even have life preservers on? We didn't have life. It was kind of like, how, how do you get on this ride? And, and we're going by. I, I love the Dominican brother. He said, can you swim, brah? I said, yeah. He said, go. He, oh, that's all it took. I'm like, where's the YouTube tutorial? Where's the explanation? Why am I signing a deaf waiver just to get in a boat? You know, that should have tipped me off. We hit this thing. I don't know about you. When people are extremely afraid, people do different things, right? When my wife is like deathly afraid, she begins to laugh hysterically. She just started, ha, ah, she's laughing. We gonna die, ha, ah. I, when I'm afraid like that, I speak in the third person narrative. I'm like, out there, I'm like, oh my God, this brother's gonna die. I'm speaking of myself, that's third person narrative. When I, when I, all of a sudden I speak like I'm not that person, right? We survived, we did all these kind of things. Man, I, I'm out on the beach, laying in the sun, putting something out. I could have started a website entitled what you don't think a brother would do dot com. I mean, I was doing it all. Now why, why did you tell me all that, Sean? Why, what does this have to do? Because the Lord dealt with me as I was coming into this marriage about this season, and he said, new seasons demands a new flow. I feel like the Lord is speaking to me, CLC, and challenging you that as we're coming out of COVID, the Spirit of God is saying to you, new seasons demands new flow. You cannot simply have your 2019-2020 flow on. You got to have a up-to-date. Come on, you get all your upgrades on your little cell phone when the app comes down or Android platform. You click on your updates because you want those upgrades. And God is saying there are upgrades available to you that you not avail yourself of. New, come on, say new seasons demands new flows. There is a modern outpouring of the Holy Ghost that we cannot go back to the level of flow we had back whenever. 
we have got to say, God, I need a new outpouring of the Holy Ghost. There's got to be a place, like when I came, to, I, I told you about all these little, if you will, geographical, I want to say they're geographical more than racial, although I joked about it, geographical lids of what I would not or would do. And the Lord in this season is saying, I'm lifting the lids off my people. I'm breaking limitation. Some of us have had generational lids, generational limitations, and something deep in your heart. You go, I love mama and them, but I don't think I want to be like and I definitely don't want my daughter and my baby and my son to be like that. There's something that's got to shift, and it only shifts when you make a decision that this has been the chicken line that I wouldn't cross, and these things I wouldn't risk. I wouldn't, like, go for it in God and step out in faith, and I'm declaring in this season, the new season demands a new flow, and that means i got to cross the chicken line. The devil draws the chicken line and say, you're not going to really be on fire for God. You're not really going to try to teach a home group. You're not really going to ask and, and use your gift now in the worship team or in the band. You're not really going to serve at the church. You're not really going to get super committed. He drew the chicken line, and what you got to do is decide no devil. Level, new seasons demand new flow. It's time for me to come out of the place of hiding in the backdrop, in the background, and and an enemy try to tell, well, you're not that kind of person. You're shy. You're not a good speaker. You're not. Who says I'm not? Demons don't cast doubt on what they don't believe in, but on what they do. So if the devil tells you you can't, it's that he knows you can, right? Because if he really can't, he'd be telling you you could because he's the author of lies, father of lies. There's no truth in him. So in a moment, how do you know if the devil's lying? His mouth is moving. Okay, that's how you know. He can't tell the truth. Mark 5, okay. I love Mark 5. And Jesus begins his ministry in Capernaum. Capernaum was the Galilean headquarters, if you will, of Jesus' ministry. He had been to Capernaum and had done miracles there before. And it's really interesting. He was there before, and he walks in the synagogue, if you will, that's the church of that moment, and he immediately in church casts a devil out in Capernaum of a man. Now, let me just stop and say this. I believe, I'm convinced, deliverance is coming back to the house of God. When I first got saved, it was nothing. I mean, we'd be at youth camps, we'd be at meetings, and, man, people would have the devil cast out. I mean, I know you're new. Somebody's new here, and you go, oh, man, what are you talking about? Hey, come on. Do you, statistically, do you, do you know? You go, I don't know if I believe in that. Do you know statistics? It is statistic in America. This is crazy. More people in America believe in a literal devil than they do in a literal God. You look at the evil of some guy that would open up shooting randomly on people like what happened in Buffalo. You can't say that's a bad diet. Come on, somebody. That, that's evil. Let me tell you, that's evil. That's demonic. Thank you. We got to call it what it is. That's not like I wake up one day and like, oh, I had a bad day. I'm just going to go to the mall and shoot up everybody and just feel a little bit better. No, no, that's a devil. That's a demon. You got to acknowledge that. And Jesus, the first thing he does in Capernaum is he casts out a devil. Guess what? In church. Come on, sometimes. Okay, now I'm going to see if you really love your speaker, right? Some of the worst devils is religious devils. They can sit up in church and shout amen, holler you down, but, but walk out them doors with no intention to implement what they just shouted you on. Religious devils are the hardest devils of all because they can sit up. It, for, for that matter, the spirit of religion has been the only spirit that's been able to unplug revival in my studies of revival. That's Teflon. You can sit there and underneath the word, but go out and be like, like immoral and going out and doing stuff and cheating and being all hateful towards folks and come back in church and say amen. No, there, you need to get set free from that. I'm telling you, I'm prophesying, deliverance is coming back to the house of God. It, you're going to see in some service, somebody's coming up and they're going to get prayer and they're going to hit the ground and shake and it's going to seem a little wild to you. But let me tell you, when they get up and you see that glow on their face, they got the glow, you're going to say, man, that's what Jesus does. Some of it, we don't have time to go 20 years and taking two steps forward, three steps back, going around in circles, getting, getting in cycles of sin and bondage and out and back in and out. Come on, I'd rather have a moment where God just says, you're free, son, and boom, whatever has to happen, I just want to get free. Jesus did this. And then after that, he heals one of his disciples' mother-in-law. Come on. Man, his, Peter's mother-in-law had a fever, right? He rebuked her fever. She passed her COVID test just overnight, right? I mean, it's awesome. And then when that word got out, all these people gathered to Jesus. People were getting healed. When Jesus shows up, it's normal for somebody to get healed. 
It's normal for someone to get healed. It's normal for someone to get delivered. So he's gone away for a while. That would be Jesus. He comes back, and the Capernaum folks heard that the Jesus that cast the devil out of that dude in church healed Peter's mother-in-law, and all them people got healed. Oh, man, they bum-rushed this house to where it is SRO Jesus. You know what SRO stands for, right? Standing room only Jesus. Let me tell you what. You don't have to make Jesus more attractive. He already is attractive. Anything you add to Jesus subtracts. It dilutes. Kind of like when you put ice cubes in your Coca-Cola. If you leave it there long enough, there are people that think they got to make Jesus sexy, got to make Jesus cute, make Jesus relevant. No, you don't have to do that. He's already relevant. He's so relevant, he's in the future already. He's in the future. I have a sneaky suspicion that in our quest as a North American church to become relevant, We've actually become irrelevant, right? Because the very thing that makes us relevant is the non-negotiable power of the Holy Ghost, the authority of God's Word, and we've walked away from that. We offer God's Word to folk like it's a suggestion. We have churches, they don't preach sin. They don't preach a literal devil. They don't preach hell. They don't preach judgment to come. And they try to make everybody feel good. No, no, no. We're not here to feel good. I can watch uh, Oprah and feel good. I come to church, so I need to feel God. There's a big difference between feeling good and feeling God. Do I anybody wants to feel God? <laughs> Woo! Somebody said, Pastor, who did you bring in to preach to us today? <laughs> I got warmed up. Right. Capernaum. The city means, it has two shades of meaning. It means city of comfort or field of repentance. So think about it. City of comfort, field of repentance. I believe that's the pull of the whole past pandemic. We either ran to a comfort zone or we ran to get right with Jesus. Remember, this city's name means city of comfort or field of repentance. I said this first service. This is the one thing I will repeat. If you got through this last season, let's say 26 months now, right? You went this past season where stuff was unplugged, we're at home, you're doing school Zoom, you're doing work Zoom, all this kind of stuff, right, that's taking place. If you didn't take that time to get closer to Jesus, repent of something, consecrate, attune your hearing and your heart to the wavelength of God, you missed it. But good news, it ain't over yet. You can still get right. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be this kind of uh, like, like, judgment kind of do, but I'm just saying, if we will get right, then we're going to begin to see the glory of the Lord. I'll give you an example of this. Right before Joshua was going to see incredible miracles uh, in, in the promised land, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said through him to the people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. This season of COVID is about consecrating ourselves because we're about to see the wonders of God. There's going to be a, a I'm, I'm telling you, it's going to shock you, the number of people that are going to get saved. There's an openness right now. I'm, I'm telling you, share your faith with folks. There are people that are open. Don't, don't be, believe the lie of the enemy. There are people that are hungry and desperate for Jesus. After 20 years of knowing I'm a Christian, knowing I'm a minister, I've witnessed to my neighbor, great guy. Uh, he walks over to our driveway in the midst of COVID, long story short, I ended up leading him to the Lord because he felt literally the press and anxiety and vice grip of last season, and he knew at that point I needed more. He represents hundreds of thousands, yea, even millions of people out there that are waiting for us to get. So that's just a side thought, but come on. We need to understand that it is a Capernaum moment for us. Now, obviously, it's, it, I, I shared it with you. It's the headquarters where Jesus Christ conducted his greater Galilean ministry. Many of the miracles took place. So he's in this place. All these things happen. And now he is back in the house. And when he's in the house, they pack it out. And here's what I say. Like, I understand today, I think we feel like we've got to have big screens, fog machines, and skinny jeans, which we have all three going on today. And that's quite all right. Your speaker got skinny, you know, all that. But at the end of the day, you know what would draw Jesus? I, let me give you a great example of this. There's a church in our area, not being critical. They don't have it currently. They had on their billboard of their sign, now serving Starbucks coffees and Krispy Kreme donuts. And I thought, hmm, yes, yeah, sis, I'm, I'm shaking my head too, right? Like, okay, you're kidding me. The commodity of the church, the church that Jesus Christ got up out of the tomb on the third day, sent his spirit that fell on 120 that began to be martyrs. They, they literally spilled their blood. The people that wrote the Bible, and man, God has left his spirit. If Jesus ever lives, in, ever lives to, to release intercession on our behalf, he's at the right hand of the Father. And the best we can offer a lost world right now is some, some sugar, right? 
and some caffeine. That's the best. No, 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 no. I'm like, you can go down to Starbucks and get better coffee than you're serving in your foyer and better Krispy Kreme donuts at the Krispy Kreme drive-in. What is it the one thing that is a church we can deliver that they can't? It is the presence of God. We got to... You got to dance with the one that brought you, right? That, that young man bought your corsage. He paid for your meal. He brought you up. He picked you up. And you're going to get to the high school prom and dance with another dude the whole night? No, 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 no. You got to dance with the one that brought you. The Holy Ghost is the one that saved you, delivered you, pulled you up out of bondage, kept your marriage, kept your kids. You got to dance with the one that brought you. It's time to bring glory to the only one. And I'm telling you, we got to get back. What is the commodity of us as a church? It is the raw presence and power of God wrapped in love that man can transform not only one life can transform cities and we got to get back to that am I like yelling right now I just felt like am I am I okay 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 I love it they completely filled the house I believe let let people know Jesus in the house they he's gonna pack it out people will come and it's y'all have had two packed services right now but here's the thing what does it tell me the world is thirsty for the supernatural he didn't do, and nothing wrong with this, but he didn't do some sort of social media campaign and put out and have a PR dude that goes out and say, okay, Jesus is coming. It's before Jesus comes, we got to do all this. You know what? He came earlier and released deliverance and healing, and massive number of people were touched. And now when he comes back, people are drawn. We cannot, there are churches that hide the Holy Ghost, or at least on a Sunday morning. They pull them out on Wednesday night small groups, but they help the Holy Spirit to a back room because they're afraid that first-time visitors would be overwhelmed. It just proves to me if a pastor would do it, you don't know the people walking through your door. Ever since they were little kids, they were raised on supernatural cartoons, supernatural playing cards, supernatural video games, watching supernatural trailers before the supernatural movies, reading supernatural novels, and all of a sudden online in supernatural uh, horoscope stuff, and then they come to church, and you're going to hold back the one thing they're seeking for the most? What? You look at the top movies that are out there. You look at all this stuff. There's a hunger for the supernatural. If there's ever a time, it, it is truly a go supernatural, go home. Go Holy Ghost or go home. Church, we got to come back to the roots. We are unashamedly people of the power of God. We believe in Pentecost. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We believe in laying on of hands. We believe in casting out devils. We are not ashamed of that. Why? Because the only answer for a sin-captured, man, demonized, addicted world is a church that knows how to release deliverance and knows how to pray you through. Come on, somebody. Oh, I'm getting some help here. Somebody say, Jesus in the house. I love this, man. Jesus is there, and, and I say this. Jesus could draw an audience, and he didn't have to do, like, like we would think, okay, what would he say, right? Well, if you're, you got to say something palatable, popular, pragmatic, politically correct. But we read that verse in Mark 2. It says, and when it came, Jesus preached the word to them. And I just want to underscore, we got to get back to word preaching. And you got a great pastor. He said, that's, that's the thing I do. I preach the word. I'm a teacher of the word. Thank God for that. I don't mind mixing in some stories and illustrations. I told you about the three types of honeymoons. I'll do that. But at the end of the day, right, the Bible says you know the truth. Truth will set you free. Didn't know, it didn't say you will know someone's opinion and opinion will set you free. You know someone's little joke and they'll set you. No, no. We got to get back to word preaching. Now, again, I know y'all would say amen on that. I want to spend a long time on that. But now here's the part where I want to shift. It says in the verse, it says that the presence of the Lord was there to heal them. How many of you will give me 10 minutes? All I need is 10 more minutes. Okay. It says the presence, thank you, sis. Presence of the Lord was there to heal them. Now watch this. Follow me. In the gospel that we read, Luke, it says the presence of the Lord was there to heal them, but we would read later, chronologically later, that four guys break open a roof, lower their paralyzed friend, and he gets healed and he begins to walk, right? We read that. He took up what he had been laying on. So follow me. The writer says the presence of the Lord was there to heal them before anyone got healed. And he didn't say the presence of the Lord was there to heal him because you would say, okay, they wrote it in retrospect. He didn't say the presence of the Lord was there to heal him, singular, one guy. It says the presence of the Lord was there to heal them, plural. Who is the them? Everybody there. What's that telling me? There were some scribes and Pharisees sitting up in a meeting that needed healing. Well, why didn't they get healed? 
Like, like here, let, let me back up for a second. We would say that because no one got healed, that the presence of the Lord wasn't there to heal. Wrong. The presence of the Lord could be there to heal, waiting to heal. The Holy Ghost is in like, like San Francisco airplanes because of fog in a holding pattern, but no one postured themselves and tapped into what God made available. Then they can go away and make conclusions that God doesn't do that. When in fact, no, God was saying, I wanted to do it. I released my presence to do it. You just never allowed it to happen for you. If the presence of the Lord was there to, to, to heal, I mean, you know, the same presence is there to do, deliver. The same presence is there for revival. Could it be that the presence of the Lord is here for revival? And we would say, well, it's just not God's timing. God doesn't want to send revival. I, I believe that there is a sovereignty of revival. I, I preach that. But I also believe there's a Second Chronicles 714. If my people called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. And let me tell you, this Savior for our nation, now, now I'm, I'm going to get, now, it's not controversial, only to people that's overly political. But let me just say something to you, right? Revivals have come regardless of who's in leadership in nations. In fact, I've seen some of the greatest revivals come under dictators and fascists and people that are socialists and anti-God. And so there's some people that think because they didn't get whoever they wanted in the White House or maybe they got the person they didn't want in the White House. I don't know how that works out for you. We think we can or cannot have revival. No, the presence of the Lord is here to bring revival in a nation. Irregardless of who's in the White House, it's who's on the white horse with faithful and true written on his thigh. Come on, somebody. And we got to quit passing the buck and thinking that who's sitting in that over the office is our Savior. They're not the Savior. Let me tell you something. The command control center for the United States of America is not the Oval Office. It's not the Pentagon. It's the prayer room, according to Second Chronicles. If I can get some folks to pray and really believe that. We're kingdom anyway, okay? I want to reach you on the left. I want to reach you on the right. I'm going to vote to protect things that I believe the Bible uh, supports. But in addition to that, I'm going to love you, whoever you are, because I am a gospel. I, I serve a king that has released me with, as an ambassador with a gospel of reconciliation. So if I'm hating folks because they voted different than me, come on, somebody. You can't. If you demonize folks on the other side, you end up fighting folks you're called to free. If I take a smile break with her brother. <laughs> so here's the presence of the Lord. Now, why didn't they get healed? Okay, let's look at this. Why didn't they get healed? So there was some, let's establish the fact again. And I've got seven minutes left. We've got Sadducees, Pharisees, teachers of the law sitting by, sitting by. Somebody say sitting by. Here, you know, it's funny. You, you use the phrase on the tiptoe of expectancy. These dudes aren't on a tiptoe of expectancy. They're sitting by. I think part of it is their posture. I think sometimes, okay, come on. Our pastor's giving me an amen, so I'm going to walk over in front of the pastor. Come on. They didn't, they didn't come to get healed. That's right. Listen to me. Here's what happens. Did you come to church for the supernormal or for the supernatural? I think there's some people that come to church expecting the supernormal. You're going to sing three songs. They're going to do an offertory. They're going to do a little video break. We're going to shake hands, get up, sit down, sing a couple more songs. I'm going to drop a buck in the plate, stand up, and walk back out and, and do all that and get me out by 12 noon. Well, then you're going to get what you expect. Many people walk out of church with the, what they expect it for. You need to raise your level of expectancy. Their problem is they didn't come to get healed. They came to find an argument. Their posture is wrong. They're all in their head. If you're in here and you're trying to find all the critiques and why this is wrong and I don't like this and I don't like that and I don't like this, Come on, somebody, do you go to your restaurant doing that? Do you watch ESPN or the Home Network channel doing that? No, you enjoy it. You come to expect, I'm going to get whatever it is you're expecting from these shows. Why don't you come to church with a level of expectancy beyond just appeasing a little guilt and clocking in and clocking back out? No, I'm believing for some transformation. I'm going to believe if I get to altar, somebody lay hand, I'm going to get touched. I'm going to get, oh, man, I'm, I'm yelling again. I'm yelling again. <laughs> Sitting by. Today, in our culture, teachers stand, students sit, right? You're in school, you're in a lecture, even if, you know, usually you'd say the person is a little bit older, but you can go to college campus. I've seen some professors younger than some of the students, so then you would know it's the person that's standing. The people that are seated are students. The person standing is a teacher. In Jesus' day, it was just the opposite. In Jesus' day, students stood, teachers sat. 
So follow me. It says the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting by. What are they saying? The reason why the present Lord is there to heal and nobody's getting healed is, watch it, they're unteachable. There's something wrong when you always figure or always figure yourself to be the smartest person in the room. Then you don't have the humility of taking on. I'm, I'm forever a student. That's one of my life bywords. I'm, for, I'm always growing. I want to continue to grow. I want to continue. You know what? The North American church are, <laughs> you know, may not apply to everyone here, but you know what? We, this is our sentiment. We know Jesus so well, we don't know him at all. We just think because, I oh, damn, my, my grandma, grandma, she knew Jesus, and my grandma, mom knew Jesus, my grandma, my mom, I knew Jesus. I knew, and, and you don't know that you, you, follow me, you have relationship with God, but you don't have fellowship with Holy Spirit. Paul ended the book at Corinth by praying that the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Why would he pray for a group already in relationship to God to have fellowship if it was a given so you may have relationship, but do you have fellowship? These guys had neither, but at least I'm saying you got relationship. Have some fellowship. Spend some time. Get excited about your time with God. Here they are. There, I could just see them. They're sitting back. And, and we all know you can get more people in a room if everybody's standing up. They always have, you know, occupancies, standing room. You can fit more people in a room. So check it out. These dudes are lounging. They're taking up space, and that's the reason why more people can't get in. Don't be the kind of person that come up in church and your attitude takes up so much space that is not inviting for those who are not like you to come in. The whole Jesus people movement, I don't have time to break it down, but God had to start entire new churches because folks was looking down at the hippies and long hair folks that didn't bathe and came in church. Well, where else are they going to go? Come on, somebody. This is, we love you. Please come here. We want it. We want LGBTQT. Y'all come up in the house. Come on. There's the love of God, the power of God to bring about transformation, but we want you here. No matter what it is, I don't want to sound like I'm just highlighting that. That's just something that some folks get their nose up in the air. But who were you before Christ saved you? Right? I believe what the hippies were to the first Jesus people movement when they got saved and converted. I believe the LGBTQT is going to be for a new Jesus people movement because they're going to be outspoken. They'll be all them things, but they're going to be sanctified. They're going to be okay with the identity God made them. They're going to have the right attraction based on how God designed them. And watch, they, they're not going to be ashamed. They're going to go for it, right? I, I'm going to preach to you, sis, because you don't want to give me S yes. And I've got a couple of amens over here too. All right? They're sitting by. Somebody say sitting by. That lets me know you could be in a crowded out service but have no room for Jesus to move. It's packed out, but it packs no punch because you're sitting down versus standing up. Check it out. <laughs> you can come out but not be connected. You could be present but not plugged in. You could have come out to church but not be connected. That's the Pharisee's statue. You can be present but not plugged in because you had plugged in. That breakthrough would flow in your life. And I believe this. Let this so, imp oh, my God. Oh, okay. Can I rock a little more boat real quick? All right, I'm going to say this in love. If some of y'all came to, to work the way you'd come to church, you'd be fired. Come late leave early, not fully involved in the meeting. You're not going to sit around Google at your think tank and be able to get the raise and stay employed by Mr. Google with that kind of attitude, like, right? Like, why would we come to church and give Jesus less than what we would give our job? Oh. Says the Pharisee and teacher of the law, why did they not have, I'm, I'm telling you some reasons why the present Lord could be there, there to heal and them not getting healed. And if I can get the worship team to come out. Number one, I told you they're sitting back rather than standing up. It's expectancy. Number two, right, they've taken on that we're the teacher, Jesus, you're the student. And that's why we're seated and we make you stand, right? I think another, I'm, I'm just trying to pull out some points as to why. The Bible says when Jesus said to them, he says, why do you reason in your hearts? He read their mind. So check it out. They're too busy reasoning they're not receiving. 
presence of the Lord could be there to heal. It could be there to deliver, there to bless you, and you not get it and then walk away and go, God didn't want to bless me, or I don't know, God doesn't like me, or whatever. You've drawn the wrong conclusion is that you were so busy reasoning you weren't receiving. That's what Jesus said. Back up. Let's say it again. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, and he says, why do you reason in your heart? This brain, God wants to use it. He doesn't want you to commit intellectual suicide. I got saved on a college campus, right? But let me tell you what. The brain isn't the organ of reception. The heart is. And this thing's got to drop about 12 inches for you to get out of this trying to nitpick and analyze and logical and all that kind of stuff and let it drop right here. And what is your heart telling you? Your heart is telling you there's something about Jesus that could absolutely transform your life and your heart would be right. And they're not going with it. I believe that if Jesus is there, you got to know there's tugs. They studied centuries. They are experts in the Torah. They understand Old Testament stuff as we would know it today. And yet here is the fulfillment of all that in front of them. And can you imagine being in a meeting, not where Jesus is just present. Jesus is there in bodily form preaching to you. And you're reasoning and not receiving. This is what, thank you, brother, said Jesus. That's exactly what they were doing. And it says that they had this, I would say, kind of a by-the-door kind of faith. You know a by-the-door kind of faith? You're kind of there, but you're ready to bounce when you're by the door. No, no implication of those sitting by the door back there. Four guys came. They have a friend. They put them on one of the mash cots, medical, you know, uh, army things. And they got a friend that can't walk. And they get there, and they hear about Jesus and all of a sudden, they come to the front door, it's packed out. They go to the side door, it's packed out. They go around back, they can't get in. Let me just tell you something. What you do when you hit an obstacle tells me what kind of Christian you are. What happens when your plans don't go the way you plan? There's some people, they have a peace out deuces, I'm bouncing, but not not, not Christians that have to gone through something. I think I'm talking to some Christians. You had to pray through some stuff. You had to battle some devils. You didn't fold up at the first time the devil threatened you or came at you. When you looked at that thing, you went to the word. You said, oh, no, devil, you're not doing this to my family. Oh, no, devil, you're not finishing the rest of my story. Oh, no, devil, you're not taking my song. I will worship my God. Oh, I know this circumstance in the way I like it, but God, you're the one thing good going on right now, and I'm not going to blame you for this. Some people start to blame God. Why did you let this happen? Hey, do you understand? job description. The Bible says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus Christ came that he have life and life more abundantly. Jesus didn't do that. The devil did that, but he's giving you power that it didn't have to stay the way it is right now. He died. He gave his life. He spilled his blood. He sent his spirit. He's released angels, gifts of the spirit, giving you the word of God that will not be altered. And he's giving you everything you need and you can call on that name. And then you're going to say, Jesus, this is what you did to me. Can you imagine? You don't understand the job description. The thief is the one that's robbing you and hitting you and tearing stuff up around you. Here is these guys and what you do when you hit an obstacle tells me what a kind of Christian. These dudes were like, we can't get in. We're not just going to, I'm, I'm going to call him Bob. We're not just going to take Bob back. No, we didn't come all this way to just get a peek and go back. Oh no, we didn't. Come on. We about to take it to the roof. We need some take it to the roof Christians. Y'all remember back in the day when they had the, the little phrase, raise the roof, raise the roof. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. We need some raise the roof Christians. I want to raise the roof on what would happen in future Smith generations. I want to raise the roof on what you believe is possible that God could do on the other side of your yes. We need some belief. I, if I had time, I could tell you about great men and women of God that literally, see, here's the thing. Common faith turns around and walks back to where you came from. But it's not a time for common faith. It's time for uncommon faith. Most people believe what most people believe, but the people that shift hin history, the people that are the hinge of moves of God, they're willing to take it to the roof. They're willing to take it to where other people won't take it. I'm going to take my Christianity to a whole nother level. I'm not going to listen to politically correct spirit telling me to tone down what I believe while you're turning up the volume on that nonsense and that filth and that stuff that's tearing up a generation. Oh no, you're not going to shut me up. I'm going to tell you about my Jesus. You're telling me about your Buddha and your Muhammad and your, come on now, I I just went on out there. You tell me about this other place or maybe even innocent stuff. You tell me about the favorite place you love to eat. Girl, where you did your hair at, that salon, what they did to you. And I can't tell you about the one that delivered my grandma of alcoholism after 35 years. Are you kidding me? 
You're all crazy about your team. You're living and dying, whether or not your sports team won this week and lost this week. And I'm feeling convicted that I said that a little bit, all right? But let me tell you what, there's someone that's more important because that sports team didn't die for you, didn't get up out the tomb for you, isn't coming back for you. His name is Jesus. I'm going to be a fan, which is sort of fanatic for anyone. I'm going to be one for him. These guys, I imagine three went up on the roof. I'm just imagining one had to stay down. They wrap the ropes around this dude. They're pulling this dude up a roof. And then all of a sudden on the roof, and they go, okay, we're on the roof. What are we going to do now? We got to tear the roof open. You go, well, that sounds like, like something you had to do. No, no, it wasn't their house. Can you imagine? You're going to someone else's house. We're going to tear up your roof because we got to get our friend to Jesus. In this season, we need Christians that are willing to alter structures to reveal what God wants to reveal in this season. It wasn't that they tore up the roof is that they uncovered the truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. This, this tiling is separating us from the revealing of what Jesus wants to do. We gotta have Christians that are willing because on the other side of that tile is your revival. On the other side of that tile is your deliverance. On the other side of that roof is the breakthrough you've been praying for. You gotta be willing to say, I'm not gonna let anything separate me from the fullness of what God has for me in this season. These do, I can imagine the Bible said Jesus was teaching. I, I know I'm going over 10 minutes, I'm probably, but Jesus, I could just see him. Blessed are uh, the, the peacemakers, you know, for they'll be, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall, you know, he's preaching, all of a sudden a piece of the roof falls right on dirt. Like, what? And all of a sudden, as people are kind of scurrying away, these guys that had tore up the roof, and we need some people that are some roof raisers. We need some roof raising reformers. We need some barrier breaking believers. We need someone that's willing to go a little further out than what's comfortable to your faith, and, or I should say to your customs, and begin to respond with a radical pursuit of Jesus. And when Jesus saw what others would say, this is destruction of property, this is vandalism, Jesus said, no, that's faith. And the dude is healed. Can you imagine y'all bouncing, jumping up and down with Bobby as he's walking? Y'all left the little mash cot back, and you're walking away, and it's because of four friends then in that moment, they, watch this, God brought somebody from outside to reveal what was available on the inside. He brought someone late to the meeting to show what was there all along. I believe that right now there's a hovering spirit of deliverance, of freedom, of revival, of healing, of breakthrough, the miracle, and it requires a person. God loves you like this. He's not going to let you go. It requires a person that says whatever has been the obstacle, whatever has neutered the process, whatever has short-circuited the current, I'm removing it out of the way because, God, if you're present to do something, I'm signing up 100%, Lord. I want that. I want you. I want the more. I'm not going to settle for less. I'm too desperate to go back to what was. I don't want a little dab do you. Y'all remember that old commercial, broker? I don't want a little dab do you Christianity. I don't want just enough to get by. I need the Holy Spirit. Somebody one time on a college campus said, you use the Holy Spirit or use Jesus as a crutch. I said, bro, no, he's my entire life support system. I ain't just leaning on one leg on Jesus. Without him, you unplug it. I don't survive. I'm, I'm taking it a step further. Would you bow your heads? Jesus, I just thank you, God, all across this place. Wonderful group of people that have gathered. And Lord, I just thank you. It was a guy, C.S. Lewis, a great Christian thinker. He wrote Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. They turned it into a trilogy of movies. C.S. Lewis, a phenomenal mind. C.S. Lewis made it easy on people like me that love to introduce people to Jesus. And he made this statement. His bowed and eyes closed. I want you to hear it. He says, the fact that your heart yearns for what earth cannot supply is proof that heaven must be your home. The fact that your heart yearns. What, what, is, he, what is he saying? You, you hunger for that which doesn't have an expiration date stamped on it. You hunger for that that lasts longer. We've all had fleeting relationships, fleeting pleasures, fleeting things. And for that matter, the entire world is fleeting according to the Bible. Expiration date isn't simply on a carton of milk, on a loaf of bread. The expiration date, whether you see it or not, is stamped on everything but your soul and the Word of God. And when the two come together, something supernaturally is birthed within you. 
The fact remains, if the devil could, he would hold your life, your hand back, your life back. He would keep you because the devil's jealous of you because you could do something he can't. You could repent. The devil can't repent. He was once the leading worship angel, if you will, in heaven, and he got booted, like booted. But he can't change. His destiny's fixed. And so he's jealous of you. Years ago, there was this gal named Black, she called herself the Black Widow. She had contracted AIDS. She was going around, I guess she's an attractive gal. She was going around Dallas, Fort Worth area, going into nightclubs and giving as many guys AIDS as she possibly could. And she'd get on this talk show, not reveal herself, called herself the Black Widow. And she says, some guy gave her AIDS. She's going to give AIDS to as many men as possible. To understand that mentality is to understand what the devil's doing to you. He knows he's going down. So he's trying to take as many people with him. But the good news is Jesus has forged a rescue mission. He loves you enough. And people say, how can a loving God send people to hell? No, no, you missed it. You missed it. Without Jesus, we're already in hell in prayer. It's like standing in quicksand and slowly sinking and blaming the person that's throwing us the rope for letting us like die and perish in the quicksand. No, no, no. They're there to save you. You're already in quicksand. The mistake is to think you're already on solid ground and he's messing up a good life. No, apart from Christ, there is no heaven. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. And hell is hell because Jesus is not there. Life without Jesus is hell in progress. So don't say God isn't a good God. No, he's a great God. And the presence of the Lord is here to save you. But you got to move from sitting back to standing up for it. If you're here right now, you say, Sean, I want you to pray for me, man. I want to know heaven's my home. I need to give my life to Jesus. I know the current activities of my life, God's not blessing. I want to know heaven's my home. That, that times at night when you feel that unrest and that fear and the stuff, some of that is rooted in the fact that you've not finalized the one thing that ought to be. You, you can think what clothes you may wear tomorrow, where you may go eat, but if you plan, you do your 401k, you plan your Roth IRA, but if you... In, you planned on eternity if you're here right now you say Sean pray with me I need to give my life to Christ I need to come back to the Lord I need to get right with God current activities in my life I know God's not blessed maybe you prayed a prayer but you've walked away the good news is you can walk back if you're here right now you say Sean I need to make Jesus Lord of my life I want this prayer I want to know heaven's my home I need to be set free I want to know the love of God I'm tired of being made to hurt if any of those things are you and you say Sean I'm ready to get right what will it cost me everything you got to repent does it, there's no blue light special at Kmart or Walmart on this one. If you're saying, Sean, pray with me. I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. If that's you right now, literally, get your hand up right now. Slip it up wherever you're at right now. Say, Sean, yes, 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 yes. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Another hand went up. Yes. Another hand. We got, I, if your hand is up, would you just stand up? Hand up, stand up. Don't be shy. If your hand is up, stand up. If your hand is up, stand up. Come on, if you're saying this prayer, come on, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Anybody else? There's 16 people. 17. Come on, somebody else stood up. Come on, anybody else? You are not alone. There's some brave folks that say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Come on. I want you. This whole place is an altar. So I have no problem calling you up front, but this whole place became an altar. So we're going to pray for you right where you're at. If you, you can have, if you're by somebody standing, would you just stand with them? I think we got a 20th person to stand now. So if you're by somebody, would you just put a hand on the shoulder? If I can get someone to walk back with my brother right there. If you see somebody standing, put a hand on them. We're going to pray together. Come on, fam. I need you to show up here. We, we, we are a family. We're a family. We're with you. We got you. We're going to pray for you. You're, you're part of family. You didn't just walk in a building and kind of part of a Christian club. This is a family. And we're going to pray. All of us together, fam, pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus. I confess you. Come on, fam. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you. As Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. Lord, I repent. I turn away from attitudes and actions, selfishness and pride, any other thing that would separate me from you. I thank you, Jesus. You died for me. You love me. And I declare this morning that I'm a child of God. And I have victory over the enemy. And Lord, I will serve you all my days in Jesus' name. Woo, come on, somebody. If you stood, yeah, give them a hug. I love, I love how y'all immediately went to hug, folks. All of you that stood, put your hand on your heart. I just want to pray for you. You don't have to repeat this prayer. If you stood, 1920 folks, 
that stood. Father, I just pray, God, over each of these that stood. I pray you would seal your love, your heart. Lord, you live in their heart and they carry your heart. I thank you, God, that you're breaking off of them struggles. You're breaking off of them, Lord, areas where they feel tripped up and feel uh, literally, they, they feel impeded from progressing in areas of their life. Lord, you would break off any bondages. I pray that the love of God would be sealed in their hearts and they would know the reality of God. And God, it isn't just a prayer we prayed, it's a life we've received. So we walk it out in relationship with a God. And Lord, I thank you that we already found a great church. We could come right back here, get involved so many things that, that, that will help us grow in our walk. And we just pray, God, that each of these would go home and the blessing and favor of God would be seen immediately in situations in their family and their businesses in their workplaces and stuff they're dealing with in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, one more hand clap for those that stood. Amen. Okay. Oh, I was go ahead, one, Just want to interrupt him for one second. Those of you that prayed the prayer with him a moment ago, in the seat pocket in front of you, there should be a connection card. That's awesome. Pull one of those out. Print your name. And the best way for us to contact you, whether it's email or cell phone, and we're going to send you the tools that will help you to walk this out day by day. It's not, it's not just a one-time decision. It's a new life. In fact, if you, if you want to, you can, you can text the word LIFE to 833-420-1244. They'll get that on the screen for you if you want to do it that way. Either way, if you fill it out in the card, drop that card in the offering boxes at any exit door, okay? Now, second thing I want to say is usually we dismiss by now. And, and I gave that information to Sean earlier. But I'm giving him permission to, to go ahead and follow the flow of the Holy Spirit. Okay? If you've got some kind of appointment on Sunday afternoon and you've got to leave, then, then we understand that. Okay? But uh, I, want to, I want to see what God wants to do for us before this day's over. All right? Awesome. Holy Spirit coming. Krista, if you'd come up here. I don't know if you guys could just sing a chorus, sis, just whatever chorus. And we're just going to pray for the sick and just minister. We're not going to keep you crazy long. We get it. But uh, I tell you what, I'll be the first to tell you. When the Holy Ghost moves, like I lose track of time. I, some about the Holy Ghost showing up, that man, you blink, and it's like, oh, my God, that was 20 minutes. Oh, my God, that was an hour. That felt like it was minutes. And that's what the presence of God does. So if you guys could just sing a chorus over us. Go ahead. So good. So come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. And this is a house of miracles. And we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. And this is a house of miracles. Come alive. So come alive. In the name of Jesus, come alive. In the name of Jesus, this, this is a house of me. You know, I want to do a quick just prayer over everyone as it relates to this area. The moral of the story, right? The presence of the Lord is wanting to move in greater ways. I've got to stop and say, God, how can I partner first, posture myself to receive and then partner with what you're there? Because notice the power was there, but it was there for a purpose. It was there to heal. First of all, I want to posture myself where the power of God lands. But then I have to partner with what is that anointing and that power in my life. And I tell you what God is doing. He's doing a lot of things right now. But one of the things is he's doing is he's causing a new fire to fall in our hearts. I don't want to walk in a pre-COVID passion. I want a post-COVID, up-to-date fire of the Lord that burns in my heart. 
I believe God wants to end this thing where we put our faith, Christian life here, our love life here, our entertainment life here, our financial life here. We've compartmentalized everything. There's something when you know, I don't watch these guys often, they do it on ESPN, and I feel like if you don't sweat or have to work out for your sport, it should be on ESPN. But they have the national poker, and he's these dudes. And when guys have a great hand, they go all in. How many of you know the cards you're carrying there is nothing else out here, and this is no reference to anything you could read, read this different than I mean it. I don't mean it at all. Just look on the original word. There's nothing in the world that can trump the hand you're holding. There's nothing secular humanism. There's nothing in the era of witchcraft. There's nothing in the era of argumentation, scientific community, anything like that, which I think honestly should be consistent with God because you can't get more scientific than that. But there's no argument out there that could trump what you're holding in your hand. So if you know that, you, I, I got a chip on my desk. It's just one chip, and it says all in. I'm all in, God. I'm all in. I'm pushing it all to the middle of the table. And I feel like that's one of the things God is saying. And the other thing, that I strongly sense that God is saying is that when the presence of the Lord is there to heal, you bring sick people. The presence of the Lord is there to deliver, you bring people that are, are bound, bound. When the presence of the Lord is there to save, you bring. So we're saying, God, I want to start being active in sharing my faith and then bringing people to Christ because, Lord, there is a move. God, God's stirring something, CLC, in your midst. And, and final thing, because it feels like I'm still preaching. I went to Israel. I hope you'll go. Our guide showed us where old Capernaum was. It was rubble and ruin. And I started thinking about that. And later God would declare a curse over Canaan. And he said, if the works, literally, that had been done over here, done in you. If he, in other words, you saw this stuff, these miracles. And if I did that in Sodom and Gomorrah or these other places, they would have repented. But you didn't. And so that lets me know that when God allows you to see stuff and experience stuff, but you don't go all in after that, the enemy is able to attack you after that in a unique way. And not like we are motivated out of fear, but I'm like, they, Capernaum, you're gone? You saw all of that? And you let the devil trip you up after that? I'm like, no, it's time to go all out. Pedal to the metal. So put your hand on your heart, all of you. I'm just going to include everybody in this prayer. Father, we are pedal to the metal, full throttle believers. Lord, we're going after you. We want to have bridal love, bridal affections, the way the, the bride of Christ loves their kinsman redeemer. Lord, we want to be people that seek your face, that go after you. We want to be the unapologetically folks that are going to love on you no matter what. We're going to keep our love on. We pray a new fire in our spirit, a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Fervency, first love fervency. We're not going to just rely on what God did in our life 20 years ago. I thank God for that. But it's like, God, what have you done for me lately? Come on, somebody. I want, and, and maybe I should rephrase it, what I'm doing for God lately. You know, It's like, God, what you do is everything. And so, Lord, we want to partner ourselves for a fresh deposit, a fresh move. So, Lord, right now, as hands are on hearts, let there be a fresh release of the Holy Spirit, a fresh wind of God. Lord, all over this place. And then, Lord, the women came and gave themselves. And, Lord, men, I'm telling you, let's step up. Come on, we got to catch up with our sisters. And, Father, I thank you. I pray deliverance. I pray freedom. I pray breakthroughs in the name of Jesus. Right here in this center section, I believe you're here, that there's a man that in your lower lumbar, I guess your, your chiropractor would say your L4, L5, like literally right above your tailbone, there's a pain that's that's going on is something in your disc something in your back and you have this chronic pain but I sense that you're a male right here in this section God is doing something I sense that there was a lady and I was saying God I felt like she was on the outsides but on one side there's a woman it, you, you may think it's not that big a deal it is if you have it but uh, you have got uh, restless leg syndrome or there's something with the lower circulatory part of your legs it's not getting the proper blood flow and you get kind of it's almost like I get this sympathetic pain you can get this numbness that almost feels like little pokes because your blood's not circulating so you have a circulating and I don't know if you've got little clots or not but something is affecting the 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 lower part is a restless leg syndrome I think but there's something that's going on with that there's another woman that you're being healed in your arches plantar fasciitis you're being healed in your arches you've had problems you can't wear your heels girl come on you got issues God is healing you in that area and it's such a, a profound thing 
And uh, I feel like there's even a young gal here that you've got a, a speaking of backs, you've got a curvature in your back. There's something going on in your back and your spine that is not straight. And I, I don't know if it's full blown scoliosis or not, but you got something there. And God is healing someone that you're borderline diabetic, a woman. Uh, actually, the Lord says there's a woman and a man, but one of you is like a borderline diabetic and the other one that there is a type of diabetes that you're struggling with. And so those are things right now that I'm aware of that God is speaking to me that are here in the house, here in the house. Wouldn't be surprised.